Hey everybody, welcome to it. This is Untangled and I am your host, Spencer Durant, and this week's episode is a very special one. We're doing a best of, so we're highlighting all the wonderful things that happened here on the show in 2023. You're going to hear a mix of episodes that y'all found really interesting and a couple of my personal favorites as well. I just thought it'd be a really fun way to review the year, revisit some of the great moments we had on the podcast, and get us ready to rock and roll for 2024. You're going to be hearing clips from episode 46, where we talk all about fishing with the mergers, episode 32, where Alex and I discuss some insider tips for success. You're going to be hearing a clip from episode 35, where I discuss how to approach new water with confidence. You're also going to hear something from episode 25, where we talk about if trout remember being caught. That was one of my favorite ones. It's a really interesting conversation. And then the last one that you're going to hear about is from episode 20, some tips about landing big fish. So we've got a ton of great stuff on this week's show. So get comfortable, kick back, relax, and enjoy the highlights. And I can't wait to see what 2024 has in store for us here at Untangled. This is Untangled, fly fishing for everyone. Presented by Ventures Fly Company. Next question comes to us. Trent from Utah writes in and says, Hey, Spencer, thank you for doing this podcast. It has been a game changer for me, and I've learned a ton from you. I unexpectedly lost my dad a few years back, a couple days after my wedding, and unfortunately wasn't done learning everything I needed to learn from him, especially his fishing wisdom. That man could catch fish out of a storm drain, like you say. We had big plans when I got back from my honeymoon to go fish the high-altitude lakes in central Utah with the big brookies you've alluded to in a couple of your episodes, and I'm hoping to make that trip this summer. I always feel closest to him while I'm out of the water, so thank you for helping me get back out there and not be completely lost. My question for you is what's the best way to land a fish once you've got it on? I can't tell you how many fish I've lost after hooking them, what's the strategies you use to hook them properly, work them in close enough, and net them. I appreciate the help. Wow, Trent, thanks a ton, man. Thank you so much. That feedback, that feedback means a ton to me, really. I am, I'm stoked that you're getting out there in the water. And that's so, so awful to hear about your dad. I'm so sorry about that. Really, really stoked that you guys were able to spend some time fishing together, though. I did a lot of that with my dad, and I know how uh, meaningful that can be. So thank you for being willing to share that and reaching out to your question. That's just wonderful. Thank you very much, Trent. Now, on to your question. Let's see if I can help you out here, okay? Landing and playing fish, there's as much of an art <laughs> to this as anything else in the sport. There is, some folks might disagree with that. Uh, by art, I mean it's something that you are going to learn the intricacies of the more and more you do it. So the fact that you have gone and failed as much as you have, and I'm you know failed in that you've lost fish, right? The fact that you've gone and done that, that's actually awesome because you learned a lot of what not to do. And I'm not saying that you know tongue in cheek like we do all the time. Like oh, I learned what not to do, right? I learned where not to shoot an elk if you want to get it. I learned how to not catch a fish. Well, you know, being glib all aside. You actually are learning from it if you step back and say, okay, what did I do wrong there? Why did that fish escape? Now, you might not know enough to know the answers to those questions, but that reflection process can teach you quite a bit. Uh, that's what I mean about this being an art, right? That being said, there are a few things that you can do that you can you can know going into landing these fish that's going to help you out. That would be you want to keep tension on the line, put the fish on the reel when you can, be aware of what your rod angle is. And then lastly, remember that you are not fighting the fish in the traditional sense of the word, right? I'm going to explain all of these in greater detail. So let's jump right into those. First off, the big problem I see a lot of beginners make when I've been guiding or just when I've been teaching other folks to fish is that they do not keep enough tension on the fly line. If you let the tension go at all, you are probably going to lose that fish. So you don't want slack line. 
when you're fighting that fish. That's why, and I harp on this with folks that I'm guiding all the time, I don't want to see any slack line. Okay, you keep the line pinched between your finger and the cork grip at all times so that when you go to set the hook, there's always going to be a tight line between you and that fish. If you go to set the hook and you're trying to hold all your slack line in your left hand, you set the hook, there's still so much play in that that you're going to miss fish. Or if you hook them, you're not going to hook them well and they're going to get away. So make sure that you keep tension on that line at all times. That is the number one way to make sure that you do not lose a fish when you're fighting it, in my experience. And I know a few other guides who would agree with that as well. That's why a lot of guides tell you, keep tip up, keep tip up, because keeping that tip up usually means that you're keeping tension on the fly line. That's what we're trying to uh, to drill into a lot of folks, is you need to keep tension on the fly line. I hope I've said that enough. <laughs> All right. But it really is important. Yeah. It's like when I tell my students at school, like, make sure you're putting your commas uh, between items in a series. You've got to do it. Right. I say that all the time. And what do they not do? Put commas between their items in a series. So same concept, just trying to make sure you don't forget it. Second, if the fish is going, like you hook this fish and it just takes off, man, like, uh, trying to think of something that takes off like me after the wing truck there's a wing food truck up here in northern wyoming by the way heaven sent i'll tell you that right now if uh, a wing it is listening uh i i'd love for you guys and coke to join the sponsorship of this podcast all right <laughs> uh seriously though if that fish just takes off your reel has way more stopping power than your hands or your fingers do and remember, this is what a reel is built for. A reel is built to provide resistance to the fish as it tries to scamper away from you. And it's partly why they cost so much dang money because a good drag costs a little bit to engineer and then to construct and make sure that it's not going to fail on you. So if that fish is running, put it on the reel, let the reel do the hard work of tiring the fish out while you focus on keeping tension on the line and getting your rod angle right. And that's the next thing we're going to jump into. But don't be afraid. I've seen a lot of folks who, it's it's like there's two extremes. Either I get clients who really want to just put the fish on the reel immediately and start reeling. They're very used to traditional, conventional fishing in that sense. Or I get a lot of folks who don't want to put it on the reel at all. So you need to kind of find that happy medium when the fish says it's ready to go on the reel put that fish on the reel. Now, rod angle, right? This is something that there's, there's a lot of schools of thought on rod angle. And I spent a good chunk of time thinking this through and then picking the brains of some other folks I know uh, to, to find some good information on rod angle to give you. You've probably watched anglers who turn their rods like side to side while they're fighting fish. And I've found that's pretty prevalent among the Euronymphing anglers. Uh, I see them do it, or I see them talk about it a lot more than others. I see Lance Egan and Devin Olson, for example, talk about that a lot. And it's great information. I'm really, really glad they share that. Some of us might look at that, though, and think, well, that's overkill. Do you really need to turn your rod like that? Well, what they're doing is they're actually utilizing the lower sections, like the butt and mid section of the rod, to help guide the fish towards the net, right? What I mean by that is if you keep your rod tip like super high and you try to use that rod tip to turn the fish where you need it to go, it's really only the tip of your rod that's exerting a whole lot of pressure on the fish. That rod tip doesn't have anywhere near the mass or the strength that your butt section does. When you can engage the butt section, you're using the power of both your reel and the stiffer part of your rod to guide the fish around in the water and get it to the net. With that in mind, if you can keep your rod at like a 45 degree angle to the fish, not super high, not a 90, kind of a 45, you're utilizing more of that butt section of the rod, but you're still allowing the tip section to do what it should do which is absorbing the shocks and run of an angry fish. Now, personally, I don't turn my rod completely sideways when fighting fish, but I do like to have the bend in my rod facing the opposite direction that the fish is going. For example, 
if the fish is going upstream, the bend in your rod should be facing downstream. And I'll kind of I'll kind of take it a little bit to the side, like a 45 degree angle to the side as well. Uh, this utilizes all the power in your fly rod plus your reel, just like we talked about. So with rod angle, pay attention to the angle of your rod. Try to keep it at about a 45 degree angle to the fish and get the bend of your rod facing the opposite direction that the fish is going. This combination of using your reel and rod angle is going to tie your fish out quickly, especially those bigger fish. And it's a pretty solid way to make sure that you're exerting pressure in a way that's not going to endanger your knots or your, uh, or, or anything else that could go wrong. If you're fighting a fish this way, you're spreading that tension out evenly. So as long as you tied a good knot, you shouldn't have to worry about it coming undone. Now, of course, that's always easier said than done, right? It'd be great if all our knots were perfect right out of the gate. They rarely are, but that's, that's why it's fishing, right? We go out, we make mistakes and we learn. Now, to finish up answering your question here, Trent, remember, you're not fighting the fish so much as you are guiding it to your net. I've talked about that a couple of times, but I, I really want you guys to think of it that way. You're trying to get the fish to swim towards your net so that you can lift its head up and slip the net underneath it. If you just try and yank uh, and horse the fish directly back to you, you're going to snap your line or pop the fish free of its hook. That's something that I see a lot of folks who fish conventionally do. They come over to fly fishing and they just want to kind of manhandle the fish in. It doesn't really work like that. Uh, the way that I've heard it described that makes the most sense to me is you want to guide the fish towards either bank first, whichever bank is easier for you to get to. And then once you've got the fish towards the slower current, because usually the current's a lot slower towards bank, then you bring it towards where you're standing in the water. If you think of it as guiding the fish to the net instead of fighting the fish, I think you're going to have a better chance of not having that fish pop off. So those are the four things that I would say are going to help you uh, land big fish, to land any fish really, but especially the big fish. If you can kind of play them like that, remember you're not fighting them, keep the rod angle right, experiment with what different side pressure does. And, and you'll see when you turn that rod uh, to the side a little bit and you get that 45 degree angle and your, your rod is bent opposite the way that the fish is going, you're going to feel that fish is having a tough time running on you. And you're going to start real, you're going to start uh, getting more fish into the net quicker, which is great for you. And it's great for the fish, right? We don't want to tire them out too much. So hopefully that answered your question, Trent. If you've got any other questions, please write in. And thanks again for taking the time to send that question. Really appreciate it. Blake from Utah writes in, says, Hey, Spencer, first off, love the podcast and your extensive knowledge. I've recently gotten out onto the rivers, and say I get to a spot where I'm ready to wet a line and I find a juicy hole, what's the best way to break that run apart? Do I divide that run into thirds and fish the bottom third, middle third, and then the top third? Just looking for some insight on how to break down a run I'm looking to fish. Any insight would be appreciated. Die lines, brother Blake. Thank you. For sending that in and I'm really stoked that you enjoy the podcast. Thank you for that too. This is a really good question and it's a question that we hear a lot from beginners and it's a question I had myself as a beginner. You, you get to the river and you're like, okay, well, where do I go to fish? What do I do? And this is what I was alluding to in the hook of today's episode. You get to the river and it's water that you're unfamiliar with. How in the heck do you go about actually fishing it so that you can be confident when you get to any water. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. And just as an aside here, we do have a huge portion of our new beginner fly fishing masterclass dedicated to water types, and in particular, this type of water, the runs that you just mentioned. So you definitely want to head over to YouTube, subscribe to us there if you aren't already, so that you don't miss it when that episode drops. That particular episode of the Fly Fishing Masterclass isn't out yet, but it will be coming out soon. Stay tuned for it. I put a link to that 
masterclass in the podcast description so that you can make sure you're subscribed and you don't miss it. Now, as for your question, you mentioned a run, and that's a specific type of water. So for those who don't know, I want to get everybody on the same playing field here. So I'm going to define runs for a second. Runs are, they're kind of like the connecting water between all other water types. They're what holds everything together. It's like the, it's like if you've ever seen the Big Lebowski, it's like the rug in the dude's room, man. It just ties the room together. (laughs) Runs are deeper than a ripple, but they're not so deep that they become a pool. The water is moving pretty quickly through a run. It's not still and slow like it is within a pool, but runs are deeper than a riffle. And since they're deeper than a riffle, they don't have the same surface disturbance that you see in a riffle. That classic choppy water surface that defines a riffle. It's very emblematic of fly fishing. You see that and you know that the fish are going to be hanging out in those riffles. And Riffles are also great because since they're shallower, it's a lot easier to see some of the seams and the transitions where the fish are going to hang out. It's, uh, and by the way, the seams and transitions, trout love those. They love any kind of place where two, two different things merge, like shallow and deep water or fast and slow water. That's what a seam is, by the way. It's the line of water. It's the line, pardon me, where water of two different speeds meets. It's a great place to target for trout because they can hang out in that seam and collect all the food coming out of the faster water into the slower water. They don't have to spend as much energy. So that's why it's a great place for them to hang out. It's like me at an all-you-can-eat wing place, right? I just have to keep telling the server, hey, yeah, more, more this way, all right? And everybody's looking at you and judging you, and you you just look at them and say, hey, you don't get a body like this unless you are willing to put in the work for it. (laughs) All right. Wings of Mountain Dew. (laughs) Oh, anyways. Back to runs. (laughs) Since runs are deeper than riffles, it can be harder to decode where the obstacles are in the river. And those obstacles, like rocks and logs, Those create small pockets of holding water. Those also create the seams. You can see that pretty easy in a riffle, again, because that water is shallow. Imagine you're standing at the bottom of a riffle, you're looking up, and there's some rocks poking up, and you can see the pockets behind the rocks, or there's a log that sits in and creates a seam. You can see the seam where the water's moving quick and then slow, and you can see that line. There's foam lines. There's a lot of easy to see information on the surface of a riffle that you lose in a run because those runs are deeper. So it's best to actually do what you said, Blake, and break that run. Uh, Yes, Blake, I'm making sure I got your name right. I'm so sorry. But it's actually good to do what you said, Blake, and break that run into multiple sections and thoroughly fish each part of it. Some people like to visualize a grid and fish runs with like that grid system where they put their flies into every square of their grid. My brain doesn't really work that way. So, and my mother-in-law would probably say my brain doesn't work at all. Uh, But what I choose to do is I like to start off by covering the water near to far. And then I cover the entire run top to bottom. And then I cover the entire depth of the run as well. I'm going to explain what I mean with those three things. So first off, I said you cover the water near to far. You want to always work, no matter what type of water you're fishing, you want to always work near to far with your casts because you don't want to spook the fish that are closest to you in the run, in the riffle, in the pool. Again, in this case, we're talking about runs. So you do not want to spook those fish that are closest to you. If you cast your line over them or you wade too close to them, you're going to spook those fish, which in turn could spook the rest of the run. And then the next thing you know, you're not catching any fish and you're really upset and you stomp off to the truck like a two-year-old. Not that I've ever done that. So fish the water that's closest to you first 
and then gradually work out further and further as you, you thoroughly fish that stuff in front of you. Now, my second point, I said cover the entire run top to bottom. Make sure you do this. Don't leave any piece of that water unfished. What you're going to find in a run as you fish through it is it's going to feel like the fish are scattered randomly. Like they're just thrown in there like a two-year-old was just like, oh, fish here, fish here, fish here. And, you know, just there's no rhyme or reason to it. It feels that way, again, because it's tougher to see underneath in the run. You don't see where all the disturbances are. You usually can't see where all of the best holding water is. That's why it feels random. It's not, but it feels that way because we lack the visual clues on the surface that we're used to in other water types. So make sure you fish the entire run top to bottom so that you're not missing out on the opportunity to catch some fish. That leads us into the third point, which is cover the water in depth. That means just make sure that you're deep enough that you're covering the entire water column. If the run isn't too deep, you can probably just fish through the entire thing once with a dry dropper rig, and you'll be set. That dry dropper rig is, it should be illegal, I think. It's so effective, and it's the way that I fish probably 95% of the time. I've been fishing a lot more uh, double nymphs under an indicator lately just because the water has been kind of weird, but a dry dropper covers you for so much of your fishing. It's a wonderful rig. But if you've gone through it with your dry dropper, you fish this run and you weren't grabbing bottom very often, or you don't feel like you caught very many fish and you think there's more fish in there, or you never grabbed bottom at all, then it's probably worth going through that with a double nymph rig or even a streamer to get down to the bottom to where all the fish are especially if those fish aren't looking up. They don't want anything else. They want something right in front of them. It's worth trying to just cover the run in depth. That's how you thoroughly cover all of the water. So you can use all these tips. Now, this is an important part to remember. So maybe write this down or I don't know, whatever the kids do these days, remember things. But you can use these tips to fish any new water confidently even if it's water that you've never fished before. These tips, these, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's always funny when the podcast guy's at a loss for words, right? Uh, these guidelines, there, <laughs> there we go, that's the word. These guidelines translate from river to river, and it doesn't matter if you're on small water or really big water. You break it down into manageable chunks. You fish that stuff near to far. You cover the entirety of the run and the depth you'll get into fish eventually. So really good question, Blake. Thanks a bunch for sending that one on in. First question to us, first question for the show comes to us today. Jake from California writes in, he says, when fishing for brown trout, is it true they have a short memory? Example, when walking up a small creek, the fish spook and easy and dart off or after you land a fish takes 20 to 30 minutes for the fish to reaccumulate i think you probably meant reacclimate and start biting again asking for a friend <laughs> just kidding thanks for all the information you provide on your podcast i enjoy listening and learning new techniques even if all the fish have drowned in your area keep up the good work jake yeah it is a tragedy man the great fish drowning of 2023 uh, for all of Wyoming, too. It's crazy. And the minute, like, you, you go across the border to Montana or Idaho or Utah or Colorado or Nebraska, fish everywhere. But the minute you step inside Wyoming, just like a switch flip, like Noah himself came and rounded them all up. Man, it, it's it's crazy. It's tragic. So I uh, appreciate that. I, I really appreciate your concern. Thank you very much, Jake. <laughs> um, Getting aside, man, this is actually a fantastic question really interesting and when I was doing research to answer this for you I was really surprised there's actually a lot less like hard and fast scientific information about this topic apparently there's like not enough money in doing a study like a real fancy scientific study that would get published in a journal and 
be talked about on CNN or something. <laughs> There's just not the money or the demand to do these studies, which I think is a load. Uh, just a load of, uh, of crap because there's there's plenty of demand. Us anglers demand it. And if we demand it, by golly, it needs to happen. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> uh, no, there are, again, kidding aside, there's, there's not as much hard evidence here. So I want to preface everything that's coming next. There's a, a lot of anecdotal evidence and assumptions. Right, We make a lot of assumptions in fly fishing that's part of the sport. There's a lot of assumptions on this topic, but there are a few things that we do actually know, and I'm going to get into those. Uh, there have been just a few studies done on non-trout species in terms of can they, how often will they come back and feed after they've been bothered or hooked or touched or spooked or whatever it is. And one of the really interesting studies that was done, it was done on catfish, but it's absolutely fascinating, okay? Dr. Charles W. Erickson, he is a professor of psychology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, shared this story. So uh, Dr. Erickson wrote this paper, and he shares a story uh, from Stephen Reeves from, I, I don't, I'm going to butcher this because it's Canadian, that, oh, that sounded awful. Uh, I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of this because it's Canadian. And the blend of, of unique uh, languages up there always gets me, but it's, I believe it's Moncton University up there in Canada. So Stephen Reeves says, and I'm this is a quote from his story, says, about 20 years ago, we built a pond near our farmhouse and stocked it with bluegills, largemouth bass, and channel catfish. A few years later, I observed a neighbor feeding the catfish in his pond. He carried a coffee can of fish pellets and would rattle the pellets in the can. At this sound, the catfish could be seen coming from all directions in the pond, leaving a wake in the water. So I decided to train my catfish to come to call. Instead of rattling food pellets in a can, I thought it would be more interesting to call them by name. I shouted out, fish, fish, a number of times as I spread the pellets in the water. Within three days, I had about 19 catfish coming to call. I continued to call and fed them on a somewhat regular basis for about two or three months that summer before abandoning the call and feeding in August. The next spring, I started the calling and feeding again, and on the very first call, about 14 catfish responded. Within two days, the number was up to 16, and that was the total for the remainder of the summer. Again, due to the press of other demands, I quit feeding in August. Five years, count them, five, lapsed before I fed or called the catfish again. At the end of this time, I decided to start calling and feeding catfish again. Imagine my surprise when on the very first call of fish, fish, the wakes of at least nine fish could be seen coming through the water. And this was before I had thrown a single pellet upon the water. By the second feeding the next day, I had 13 fish coming in to feed. These were probably the only survivors since this was the highest total I was able to count during the summer. Really interesting recollection there, right? And again, it's on catfish, not trout, but we can surmise that fish probably have some sort of memory of being hooked, right? If catfish can remember the call and to come when they hear the rattle of a can or hear fish, fish, and they know they're going to get food with that, it's safe to assume they're probably also going to remember being hooked a little bit. But how long, like a, an actual number of how long it takes for fish to start feeding after they've been hooked, I mean, that's really going to be anybody's guess, and it's probably going to vary wildly depending on where you're fishing and what fish you're catching as well. I'm, And again, I'm not aware of any hard and fast data that exists on this topic. So if you are aware of that or if you know of anything, please share that information with us. I think that would be just an absolute blast to go through and share with all of the folks here that listen to the show. So if you've got that information, please send it on in. But I think your idea of waiting like a half hour is a really good rule of thumb for giving the fish a rest before, like if they got spooked, for example, let the pool rest for like a half hour before you go through it again. I know folks who will fish a stretch of water really hard, uh, you know, if there's a hatch going on, 
and the fish are just kind of ignoring that hatch. They'll fish it hard. And then if the fish aren't taking that fly, they'll, they'll sit on the bank for 15, 20 minutes, rest it, go back to it. That's pretty common. And it seems like that timeline of anywhere from like 15 minutes to a half hour is a pretty solid time to wait yourself. Uh, and that, that fits with what I've experienced as well. Uh, a little story about that. I was up on a stream that I grew up fishing in uh, kind of central Utah. And there was, uh, there was a stretch of it that ran through a campground up on Forest Service land. And I'm up there. I was with my dad. And I was, I don't know how old I was at the time. I was maybe, I want to say like 13 or 14. I was not very old. But we're up there fishing together and very first cast I hooked just this enormous rainbow now the rainbow was probably 14 inches long but for that creek and to my 13 year old eyes that was the biggest most wonderful rainbow trout I'd ever seen I'd never seen anything quite like it and I was ecstatic I hooked it I look at my dad I hollered dad dad I caught it dad I got it dad and then it got off because I was 13 I didn't know what I was doing especially not with a trophy fish like that. Well, I left that fish be for about a half hour, went upstream, fished a little bit, then my dad and I were about to leave. I go back down to that same spot, drift my fly through there, and lo and behold, that same fish, I'm fairly certain it was the same fish because it was it was big and this stream was not going to grow a lot of fish that big. But regardless, even if it wasn't the exact same fish, it was in the hole when I'd hooked the other one. So it had it was either the same fish I'd hooked or it had been spooked, right? About a half hour later, come back, hooked it, caught it. So, and it was a wonderful little rainbow trout. I'll have to find the picture and share it with you guys. They're really pretty. They're all wild rainbows up there. But that was about a half hour wait. So I think that's a really good rule of thumb. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think it's a really good rule of thumb to work with. And like I said, if anybody's got some actual scientific data on this subject, please share it with us. I think it'll be wonderful to dive through. Uh, but really, really good question, Jake. Thanks for sending that one in. A lot of fun to go through that topic. So the next thing I think I want to talk about, uh, and you know, I'm just going to go right down this road because I think it ties in with what we've been talking about is presentation, man. And like we alluded to, and uh, there's a little short that we do for the podcast, so you'll see it on our social media if you're following us. And if you're not, well, what are you doing? Follow us. We're crying out loud. Come we on. We put so much hard work and effort. Do you have any idea <laughs> what it takes to wake up in the morning and go viral on TikTok? Because I do. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Oh, no, but we did our little podcast short this week on the presentation. And really, like, what it boils down to is, and I've told this story before, uh, the lesson I got in presentation, I was in Boy Scouts back in the day, right, back in Nam, and we were, uh, we were on this little mountain, real small, out of the way, middle of Utah, nothing really noteworthy about this mountain at all, except for its giant brook trout, uh, <laughs> the folks who know will know anyways we're, we're on this mountain for scout camp and we found this little stream behind this lake and there were enormous cutthroat in that stream now the cutthroat were probably like 15 inches which is a good cutthroat that's pretty good but to us you know i think we were like 14 15 the fish always seem bigger yeah they were a kid for enormous sure. we were we were out of our minds and they just would not eat we were fishing worms on a hook, and they were, and the cutthroat were taking one look at that going, oh, no, I'm not eating that. that that's sus, to use a word the kids say these days, right? Uh, so we couldn't figure it out. So we go up and talk to our scoutmaster, Chad. Chad's one of the greatest guys I've ever met, really knows his stuff. And Chad took one look at our rigs and said, well, of course they're not going to eat that. It looks like crap, because it did. Our knots were awful. You could see the whole hook through the worm right there. <laughs> there was no subtlety to it at all. So Chad cut it all off, retied everything, and said, this is a tie clean knot. And the fish are going to eat it if it looks good. You've got you to make it look 
appetizing to him. So I was like, all right, well, whatever, Chad, what do you know? You're just an old guy. You're, you're kind of bald. What do you know, Chad? <laughs> well, it turns out Chad knew a whole heck of a lot because well, what did we do after we went down with our new rigs that Chad put on? You caught fish. We caught a whole bucket load of fish. We had dinner that night. Whoa. Yeah. So it was a, it was a big learning moment for me, and I've remembered that all the years later because it was just that little lesson of it's got to look good, it's got to look enticing to a fish. And that's that's another big lesson that I think a lot of beginning anglers forget is it's not enough to just, like, put a fly out there, right? You can't just get a salmon fly and plop it out there and be like, all right, fish, jump into my net. It, it doesn't work that way. I would argue that presentation is much more important than even the fly that you have on most of the time. It can be. It can be. It, you can you can fish the wrong fly, but if you fish it well enough, fish will probably eat it. I agree. Right? As long as that presentation looks good, but you can have the perfect fly on. Perfect match for everything. And fish are going to ignore it because it just doesn't look quite right. Yep. So that, that drag on the surface, yep. um, you could even, I would say, Part of presentation is making sure that it's at the right depth. Yep. Um, yeah, so. There, there's a lot that goes into presentation. I guess, what are some things that go into presentation? What would you, if you were talking to a beginner angler uh, and you're like, presentation is the most important thing. I tell him to watch me because I do it perfectly every time. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, for those of you in Rio Linda, that was a joke, all right? Uh, <laughs> anyways. Uh well, what I'd tell them, number one, look at the drag, uh, whether you're fishing dry flies, dry dropper, or nymph rig. Drag meaning? Drag, if there's a wake going off behind the fly or your strike indicator at all, then that means it's not moving naturally. You want that to move naturally in the water. And that's the biggest issue that a lot of beginning anglers have is like figuring out what drag looks like and how to get rid of it. It's kind of like if you were to drop a leaf on top of the yep. water and just watch that leaf drift across the water surface. That's how you want your fly or your indicator to look. Yep, it is. So that's the big thing uh, that, that I'd tell you is make it look natural, make it look normal. And then the other thing, you don't want to use too thick of tippet either. Uh, you know, I've, I've seen some beginners that were using like two X on everything. Cause they're like, Oh, it's 12 pound test. We, you know, I don't want the fish to get away. Well, okay. For a 10 inch brown trout, that's overkill. <laughs> All right. That flies just not going to drift naturally. No. If it has that big of line. It's not because flies are nowhere near as big as lures or other rigs, uh, that you're used to in conventional fishing. So it is a mindset change that you have to make. Uh, but it, it consistently blows my mind how fish get leader shy like that. It, like you wouldn't think that they would, but they yeah. do. And we just see it time and time again. It's really interesting uh, how often that plays out. And where again, we fish. I think it comes back to that tailwater versus high mountain stream thing where, um, a lot of the times if you're on that tailwater tip, it becomes even more important sizing yeah. down, making sure that it's drifting naturally. I've had some bad drifts on some high mountain streams and the fish still eat it, yep. but they're a lot more forgiving. They're a lot more forgiving, but I would say the majority of the time presentation is king. Yeah. hundred percent. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the time back over to you, Alex. This question is the one that teased in the hook of the show. It's one of the title. We're talking all about a murder's, and we have Chris from Utah to thank for sending this one in. Chris wrote in, said, what is the difference between a dun, a spinner, a cripple, etc.? How should I decide when to use any of those compared to a normal dry fly like a parachute? Along with that, excuse me, along with that, how do I decide when to use an emerger and what are the strategies for using those? Chris, this is a really, really good question. I, I love this one. And I, I really like that you're digging into some of the meat and potatoes of fly fishing here. I, I really do enjoy that. So I would advise everybody to get comfortable because we <laughs> are going to be on this topic for a minute. So grab your Diet Coke because we all know Diet Coke is the premier beverage of choice among those of us who do not drink. Uh, I am one of those. So I, I do love my Diet Coke. When I need the hard stuff, I bust out the Mountain Dew. All right. 
Uh, anyways, grab whatever beverage you like. Get comfortable. We are going to be on this topic for a minute because there is a lot to discuss here. So like I mentioned in the hook for this episode, emergers are a really effective fly that a lot of folks, they just don't understand them. They hear the phrase, they've seen them for sale at the fly shop or on the VFC website because, I mean, to be real, you're buying your flies from us. I, I know you are, right? Because uh, we have the best. So I'm just, just saying. And anyways, you see a merger kicking around and you just don't, what are they? Why would you use them? How do you use them? Like Chris said, you know, what, what are the strategies for using these? So I'm going to answer Chris's question about the difference between flies. And then I'm going to go into detail on how to fish emergers themselves. So let, let's break down what he said. A done is the adult version of a bug. It is alive and well. It is happy. It's mating. That's their kind of their whole point. They're, they, they hatch to, so that they can mate and make more bugs. So that, that's their whole thing here, not to get into, you know, birds and bees and whatnot on VFC uh, Untangled, but I, I guess we are a little bit. Well, it's kind of awkward. Uh, anyways, the, that is, that's what they're there for, right? The duns are the adult version. They're healthy, they're happy, and they're mating. That's what you want to remember about the dun version of an aquatic insect. A spinner is the dead version of that bug that falls back down to the water after it's finished mating. Sometimes you'll hear these referred to as a spent wing. A cripple is a crippled version of a dun that is still stuck in the surface film. An emerger, for those who don't know, is the emerging version of an insect that is often stuck in the surface film. And you're going to hear me refer to the surface film a lot. Really what happens if you look at a river, a lake, any water, really there's a little bit of tension at the surface of that where there's almost, I'm not going to say microscopic, but there's a discernible film on the surface where there's a little bit of tension and you break that tension and then you start to sink. So you're either above it or below it. And then right in between is that surface film. If you, if you guys are watching, I'm holding my fingers up really closely. The surface film is not very big. You've got floating on top of the water. You've got underneath and sinking. And in between is this tiny little zone called the surface film. And a lot of bugs will get stuck there because they have to break through that tension as they are hatching, as they are emerging. They've got to break through that tension and get out and become the full duns that they are if they hatch in the water, because not all aquatic insects do hatch in the water. Some of them do, some of them don't, and that's a discussion for another day. But if they're coming up out of the bottom of the water and they get stuck in that surface film, that's the location that we're talking about. You will see a lot of bugs there. You'll, you'll notice it the next time you go out on the river. So to understand when you're going to use them, now that we know what the differences are, to understand when, to answer Chris's question there, when do I pick the emerger versus the cripple versus the dun versus the regular, the, the whatever it is, we need to understand rise forms. That That's where you will be informed on what fly to fish mainly by the rise forms. So a rise form is exactly what it sounds like. For those of you who don't know, a rise form, it is Simply, it is just the disturbance that a fish makes when it eats a bug off the surface of the water. Now, if you're watching the video podcast, you're going to have a fancy graphic popping up on your screen right about now that talks about rice forms. As you can see, when trout eat emergers, they just barely break through the surface to do so because, again, those emergers are stuck in the surface film or Maybe they're not even in the surface film yet. They're still just kind of floating under the surface a little bit, and they're about to, to shoot up and hatch. They're just kind of hanging out. They're below the surface a tiny bit. And when trout come up to eat those bugs, you are only going to see the fish's back and tail fin break the surface. It's a very soft, very subtle eat. And again, you'll just see the dorsal fin and the tail fin break the surface. It almost looks like the trout just kind of levitates up and the back and the tail fin break the surface, and then it levitates back down. And honestly, that's kind of the motion that the trout are making anyways. When trout eat a dun or any other bug that is on the surface of the water, like a grasshopper or an ant, you are going to see the trout's head and nose 
break through the surface of the water. This rise will often be a lot louder, maybe a bit splashier than an emerger eat. And this next question is, a, it's the, the one about fly tying. So you're definitely going to want to be uh, comfortable because this is a really, I had the opportunity to give a really in-depth answer to this question, and I love when I get to do this. So thank you for sending this one on in, Wayne. I'll get to your question here in a second, but thanks for sending it in. And uh, yeah, so definitely get comfortable because uh, we're going to be here for a minute talking fly tying. So and we haven't really talked a whole lot of fly tying on the podcast. So I'm stoked to start getting more fly tying uh, questions. It's a lot of fun. Anyways, Wayne from Colorado whites it, whites. Wayne from Colorado writes in. There we go. I love the podcast and hope you keep it going for years to come. I started fly fishing a year ago and was so hooked I got into fly tying and really enjoy that as well. But neither is a cheap hobby. <laughs> you got that right. I find myself substituting out different colors and materials based on what I have because I tie so much variety of flies that I have a bunch of material, but often I'm missing a specific color thread or type of feather or dubbing. How much of a difference does it make in making reasonable variations to pattern recipes? Secondary question, being that you like wings, would you consider doing a Hot Ones challenge on the podcast? Wayne, I am absolutely going to do that. We actually have some really fun food-related video ideas coming up soon, so you're going to want to subscribe to the Ventures Flyco YouTube channel. Keep an eye out for those because they are going to be fantastic. Anyways, to your question, Wayne, the process that you describe is actually something that I think every fly tire does because it's just it's almost necessary in a lot of ways. I mean, I'm I'm three hours from the nearest fly shop that has a decent selection of tying materials. There's a couple about an hour from me, but their their tying materials leave leave a lot to be desired. And it takes like a week to ship anything out here to me. I mean, prime shipping is a week out here in this part of Wyoming. So it's just you you get used to it eventually, unfortunately. Uh, I have to improvise with the materials that I have a lot. Uh, as an example, I recently ran out of hair's mask dubbing for my hair's ears. So I started using, I had a coarse, it was a natural color of rabbit dubbing. And it's actually worked really well for the bodies on my hair's ears. I love it. It's turned out well. It's buggy. The fish like it. So that's really good. And I think I'm actually going to keep using that type of dubbing. For all my hair's ears moving forward, I like it more than the hair's mask dubbing that I was using. So that's just one example. It happens, and it's, it's uh, you know, I think, I think you'll actually find that as you make tweaks to your fly patterns, you are going to start to tie them in a way that is all your own. And often, you'll be able to match them, and you might even do this without realizing it, you'll be matching them to the rivers that you that you fish the most. Um, another example, the blue winged olives on my favorite river that I love to fish, they are really, really dark. I actually use a dark Adams dubbing instead of an olive dubbing on the body for those flies because they're so dark in real life. They're like blue winged black olives instead of blue winged green olives or blue winged olives. So it's a, it's just a whole different color scheme. Uh, that, that we've got going on there. And making these variations and making these changes, it's actually something that I encourage everybody to do because the more that you experiment and tweak patterns, the more you increase your chances of finding a new spin on a pattern that might work really well for you. And it's fun. It, it livens up the process a little bit. And as long as you're making tweaks within reason, you're not going to see that it it drastically changes the the uh, the fly recipe, especially when your big things. Remember, when we're trying to match the hatch, we're matching size, then shape, then color. If you are able to still keep the same size and shape with the different materials, you're going to be fine nine times out of ten. So it's all it's the rare instance when it needs to be a perfect color, but most of the time you're going to be okay. Now, 
getting this question about fly tying tips got me thinking, and this is obviously what I teased in the hook to the show today, but I rounded up some tips for fly tying that I think will really help you take your skills to the next level. There are a few things that I've learned on my own here, uh, and then I actually went and chatted with Berkeley. He is one of the guys here at VFC. I mentioned last week his incredible uh, his incredible flies that he's been tying lately. He's been working on a fly tying project for VFC, and his flies are just freaking epic right now. They're so good, and some of the best flies that I ever I've ever seen. And Berkeley hasn't been tying all that long. I forgot to ask him. I I don't think it's been too long that he's been tying. Uh, I I think I've been tying longer than him. Than him. I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure, but. He's made such a huge leap in quality of his ties lately. Like, they're spectacular. They're spectacular ties. I asked Berkeley to give some tips as well. So there's a big chunk of tips from Berkeley here, and then I've got a few. And just as a reminder, we also have a fly tying master class on YouTube. It's completely free. We walk you through everything you need to know about tying flies. So if they're just started or if it's something that you're interested in, there's a link in the podcast description. I highly recommend checking that out. Alex did the bulk of the work. Well, bulk. He did 95% of the work on that thing. I contributed like an idea, and that was it. Uh, <laughs> like oh, half of an idea, maybe. So it really is Alex's baby, and it turned out amazing. So definitely go watch that. All right. Uh, let's get into the tips. I said there's 13 of them. I'm going to read Berkeley's first. He sent them to me, and I'm I'm just going to read them. I did something similar like this in episode 42 with Alex's tips about split shot. So same kind of thing. I'm just going to go through, read them, and if I'm offering any of my own commentary, I'll try and make it clear that it's me and not Berkeley. So Berkeley's tips, we are going to jump right into them. Tip number one, practice, practice, practice. Always try to make the next fly better. You want to start slow, work your way up to being efficient. Tying flies fast comes with familiarity of the pattern. Stick to one pattern, master it before you move on to the next. Every time I tie a new pattern, I almost never get it right on the first try, but after two to three tries, I usually have it pretty darn good. After a few more, I usually have it pretty close to perfect. Unless it's a dry fly, then it's more like 12 tries. Uh, sidebar, this is Spencer's thoughts. Yeah, Berkeley, I'm right there with you. My dry flies take a long time to get looking good. So 100% I'm with Berkeley on that one. All right, back to Berkeley mode. Uh, thread control and thread tension. This is tip number two. Make sure that you have an adjustable bobbin. If you're bending your hook up and down, then you definitely have too much tension and you need to loosen it. If you hang your bobbin and it can't hold the weight and becomes unspooled, then it's way too loose. Somewhere somewhere in the middle, excuse me, is just right. You also want to pay attention to your thread length, thread length. Play around with how long your thread is at all times. Sometimes you'll want it to be a bit longer, but most times you'll want it just about 2 to 3 inches or even less. Practicing tying flies will give you a sense of where your bobbin needs to be. You also need to pay attention to your thread being flat or corded. Every wrap of thread around the hook winds up your thread. Most threads start off flat. The more and more you wind your thread, the more corded and less precise you will be with your thread as it's wrapped around the hook. It's a good habit to get into after every step of wrapping your thread to spin your bobbin counterclockwise until your bobbin can sit mostly still. This is especially important on tying in materials with a pinch wrap and when creating a thread collar or body. Uh, another little sidebar there, uh, uncording your thread 100%. That is, it's something you don't really think about, but you want that thread to lay flat. And if you wrap, 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 and wrap, and you never take the time to uncord it, it also it becomes almost like a little mini rope, and it's a lot thicker as you're laying those wraps on. So I love that Berkeley gave us that tip. All right, back to Berkeley mode. We've got tip number three, proportions. You want to make every thread wrap count. You'll be tempted to wrap your thread perfectly around materials you tie in. More times than not, you'll be adding a lot of bulk to your fly, and those extra wraps won't make a difference in the durability of the fly. Make every thread wrap count. 
Tip number four, dubbing. Most flies you'll want to use a lot less dubbing than you think. Dubbing a fly with a taper requires a lot of practice. I personally have used dubbing wax and find it helps a ton. Another sidebar here. Yeah, always use way less dubbing than you think because it, it, a little bit of that stuff goes a long way. It's incredible. It's like glitter. It just never goes away. You can't get rid of it. That's how dubbing is. I've got a package of dubbing I've been tying from for like five years. And now I say that and it's going to be empty the next time I go to tie a fly. But it does last quite a long time. You really don't need too much of it. So I think we're on tip number six now. I'd, I really should have numbered these when I got them from Berkeley. <laughs> oh, shoot. We'll, we'll go with six. All right. Back to Berkeley mode here. We got tip number six. Uh, most steps are reversible. Tie, did you tie your wings too long or too short? Unwrap them to the right length. Most steps in fly tying are reversible. Not all, but most. So take the extra time to unwind your thread and try again. Tip number seven. The scale of different videos. It's helpful to have a copy of the fly laying around that was tied commercially that is high quality. The videos online are shot on macro lenses, meaning they'll magnify the fly 50 or so times larger than the fly actually is. The video is definitely the best way to learn, but sometimes it's hard to tell the scale of the fly and the proportions of the materials being used. Having the copy of the fly near you gives you a much better reference point and model to copy. All right, tip number eight, teachers and uh, looking for multiple teachers and multiple videos. There are a few great YouTube channels online for tying flies, Fly Fish Food, Charlie Craven, Davey McPhail, and Tightline Productions, Kelly Gallup, and Barry Ward Clark are usually my go-to channels. There are, a lot of, there are a lot more out there. Most are pretty good. Try watching multiple videos for the same pattern that you're going to tie. Everyone has their own best way of doing it, and you'll pick up a little tips and tricks from everyone. And one will usually resonate with you more and become your go-to method for tying that specific fly. All right, Berkeley, thanks a ton, man, for sending those in. Those are really fantastic tips. And again, Berkeley has been tying like nonstop for three, I think three months now. That's been his, his main focus has been a, a big tying project. So I really like how timely those are. They're kind of born out of his, his time of figuring it out. Uh, I have a few tips as well that I'm going to share with y'all, uh, and this will round out the 13. I don't even remember which one we're on, so I'm just, I'm just going to go through mine at this point. I don't, I don't know what number I'm supposed to be on here. So uh, my first tip, pay attention to some real-life bugs. Try to mimic your flies after them, especially when it comes to their size and shape. I've actually created a few of my own emerger patterns, and I did that by looking at pictures of emerging blue wings and tying flies to match that bug as closely as I possibly could. The more that you study bugs, the better your fly tying is going to end up being. I also highly, highly, highly recommend, and if I had two cameras, I would show you what my fly tying desk looks like right now. It's, it's in the podcast studio slash guest bedroom slash tying office slash storage room. Uh, but, but, uh, it's funny cause I'm saying organize your tying materials. That's what I'm telling you to do. And my desk is not organized, but trust me when you take the time to actually do it and put it away, that's the big thing. That's where I suck at it is putting it away. But if you do it, if you will organize your stuff and put it away when you're done, you will know where everything is. I waste so much friggin' time looking for materials. They're always buried under piles of junk. I, I say you should never trust a fly tire with a clean desk, but there's a difference between a desk littered with used materials and never putting your materials away, which is what my desk looks like right now, and it's awful. You will streamline your, streamline your tying process if you organize your materials and put them away after each tying session. I also highly recommend getting a tying light slash magnifying light. I've actually got this LED magnifying light and glass, so it's like the, the magnifying glass, and there's a light around the, the edge of the glass. Uh, I freaking love this thing. I can see all my flies up close. It's made a huge difference in how I'm able to tie, and I honestly can't tie without it. It's like getting trying to get me going without my Diet Coke in the morning. It's just, I mean, don't do it, right? 
because <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> don't don't try. Let me have my Diet Coke, and then I'll get going. Same thing. Let me have my, my LED magnifying light, and I can tie some flies at that point. Uh, Berkeley touched on this earlier with dubbing. I'm going to touch on it one more time, though. Make sure you're learning how to use dubbing. It took me years to figure out how to do a tapered body uh, with dubbing. The key that I've found, and Berkeley mentioned using uh, dubbing wax, and that's really good. I wet my fingers, and then I'm very particular about how I spin the dubbing onto my thread. But I also try to put my dubbing on my thread tapered as well. So closer to the thread or closer to the hook, I put it on very, very thin. And then I add just a tiny bit more as I get lower down the thread because that's how your taper goes, skinny skinny to fat. So I try and taper it on the thread a little bit too before I even wrap it onto the hook. And I found that can help me sometimes as well. But try the dubbing wax, try a bunch of different tip or try a bunch of different ways to do it. And eventually you'll find a way that works for you. I also highly recommend learning how to work with hair, deer hair and elk hair especially. They are integral parts of staple patterns like the elk or caddis. I hate tying caddis because I hate working with elk hair because I'm still not as good at it as I would like to be. Uh, One thing that I have done that has helped me though is I use a lot less hair than I think I need. It's kind of in that dubbing uh, zone as well. Just use less stuff than you think you need. Uh, it's just, it, it'll make your tie in points a little bit cleaner. Uh, it'll make your flies look a little bit less bulky. And I also like to try and cut the butts off at an angle before I tie my wings in if I'm using like a hair wing, uh, because it, it helps that tie in point become a lot less bulky. So that that's my spiel on the hair. And then my last tip for y'all is practice tying your parachute posts. Parachute flies are my go-to dry fly pattern because they're they're super simple. They look really good on the water, and I love how they float. They're really easy to see. I I just love them. And I practiced. I I've tied I've tied tons of different parachute posts for a while, uh, and I I keep going back to Antron yarn for my posts instead of calf hair because I've found that it's easier to work with for me, but calf hair does seem to float better. So experiment with your parachute posts, practice them, get them down good so that you are comfortable tying in just about any material. So if you find one that floats really well, you can make a good parachute post out of it. All right, that should be 13 tips to level up your fly tying. I hope that those make sense. If you need clarification on them at all, please let me know. And don't forget to check out our Fly Tying Masterclass on YouTube. Again, there is a link to that in the podcast description.